When I was growing up, my favorite television show wasn't one of the conventional cartoons like G.I. Joe or X-Men. People tend to assume I had a sad childhood when I say this, but it's not that I was deprived of cartoons by draconian parents. Cartoons typically aired early on weekend mornings, which meant you had to go to bed early the night before to get up in time for the shows. I always overslept, so I never saw the cartoons. But why was I oversleeping? Because I always stayed up late to watch David Letterman, the host of The Late Show with David Letterman, for over 30 years. I didn't know it at the time, but of all the late night television hosts, David Letterman was one of the most legendary. I just watched because I thought his top 10 lists were funny in an adult way that I couldn't quite understand. He would talk about economics, and though I didn't quite grasp the specifics, I knew the general feeling he was trying to convey, and would laugh when my older brother laughed. I didn't get many of the digs and jabs he would take at guests, but I saw a specific tone and facial expression, and went along with it. It wasn't until I grew older that I started to really notice the subtle tactics Letterman used to energize boring guests and turn dull segments into funny ones. In particular, it was his ability to banter wittily with his band leader, guests, and even himself in a self-deferential way that was the engine of the show. Letterman was like Teflon. He was so smooth and slick, he could always go with the flow. Nothing ever seemed to faze him, and he was never without a witty quip or two. It seemed as if he could joke about anything, and his jokes never seemed forced or out of place. It didn't work as well for me when I tried emulating Letterman the next day at school, but it did get me thinking about what constituted a person who was, conversationally, so slick and smooth, so able to let anything negative roll right off of them, that they were Teflon. How can you not just always have something to say, but always have something witty and clever to say? Witty banter is many things at once. Disarming, charming, intelligent, and quick. It almost sounds impossible when you think about the effects it has on others. But banter is a skill, just like pitching a baseball or underwater basket weaving. Once you know the patterns and building blocks, you can practice and improve them. And once you practice enough, they become instinct and habit that come easily to you because they're second nature. This book is going to be one of your best tools for becoming adept at the kind of witty banter that will help you succeed in social situations. You'll learn what makes a statement clever, how to deliver it quickly, and how it all comes together to make you someone of note and worth talking to. We'll start with techniques for flowing conversation. You can't achieve wit if you're caught in awkward silence. Never speak in absolutes. Don't mind the irony in the section title using the word never to warn against using the word never, but I stand by it. One of the most common ways to kill any kind of conversational flow, regardless of how interesting the topic might be, is when one of the speaker reduces their questions to absolutes. Absolutes are tough to answer, and sometimes even to contemplate, as you're about to read. I was once set upon with absolute questions by a cousin at a family gathering, he was eight at the time, so it was excusable. But I'll never forget how it felt when someone kept talking to me in absolutes. He asked me what my favorite ice cream flavor in the entire world was. I thought for a while and said, Rocky Road. He started howling that I had horrible taste and demanding to know how I could forget Neapolitan. Next, he asked me what my favorite television show of all time was and so on. It was a tortuous conversation, full of long pauses and subsequent judgment of my tastes and opinions. Years later, he would discover that he was lactose intolerant, so the joke was ultimately on him. There are more common absolute questions that you'll come across in your daily life, but the point is that they are difficult to answer off the cuff, because doing so requires some indexing, thought, and decision making. That's a lot to ask within the flow of a casual conversation. Whatever train of thought you previously had must first be derailed in order to answer this question, and then, where does that leave you? Absolute questions usually appear very innocent, 
For example, what's your number one favorite movie of all time? That's a pretty innocuous question on its face, but it is an absolute question. It puts people on the spot and usually leads them to answer with, um, not sure, let me think about that. Then never finish their thought, which of course then derails your conversation. You might as well ask them to solve an arithmetic problem. For instance, what's your favorite band? I don't know, let me think about that. Hmm, I'm not sure, what's yours? I'll get back to you on that, I have no idea. The problem here is that you're asking an absolute question, which begs for an absolute answer. When you do that, you offer the other person no wiggle room, and worse, you've given them the difficult task of coming up with a definitive answer to your question. What is my favorite movie? Your question will fail, the conversation will stall, and you may never get back on track. Most people like to tell the truth, and if they're tasked with something that requires them to really dig deep and come up with an honest answer to an absolute question, they'll try to complete this difficult task. A small percentage of people will be able to come up with something quickly, and another small percentage of people will give a response that vaguely satisfies your question. About 1% of people will have these things on the tip of their tongues for whatever reason, and the rest won't know how to respond. The bottom line, it sounds simplistic and unimportant, but using absolute statements, answers, and questions makes conversation difficult and leads to premature death of the conversation, not the people involved. A primary rule of thumb for conversation is to make it easy for the other person, which of course makes it easy for you. Moreover, it's obvious that no one wants to carry the burden of a conversation. No one wants to fill in all the blanks, prevent all the silences, and direct the entire discussion. If your line of questioning ends up putting the burden on the other person, as if it were a job interview, that other person is either going to disengage quickly or bounce everything back to you with the what about you response. Then you're gonna to have to deal with the mess you've created. When you ask somebody, what's your absolute favorite fill in the blank? You're putting them on the spot. You're really asking them to dig down and think, and worse, to commit to something that they may not have strong feelings about. They'll likely just say the first name that pops up in their mind and pass it off as their favorite because they don't wanna to take too long to respond. That might be fine once or twice, but imagine how they'll feel after a while if every question you ask is along similar lines. They'll start to feel as if they're in a job interview or in an interrogation instead of a pleasant social interaction. They'll feel as if they're being put in a position of carrying the burden of the conversation, a responsibility they don't particularly want. It's very tiring. So what's the solution here? Let's see how we can modify these absolute questions into questions that are far easier to answer and won't stymie people or stall the exchange. Put boundaries around the question and make it non-absolute, and people will be able to answer the question far more easily. A common absolute question might be, what's your favorite movie? Transform this question into, what are your top few movies? What are some good movies you've seen recently? Any movies you can recommend? Do you prefer to watch television or movies? These questions go from more specific to broader and easier to answer. By doing this, you're not tying somebody into an absolute commitment or an absolute statement. There are several qualifiers here based on number or time, and when people don't feel pressured to come up with an absolute answer, they can relax and answer just about anything. Moreover, open-ended questions like these give you enough material to respond well. If someone names a movie as their favorite but you haven't seen it, you're likely headed for an awkward dead end in the conversation. On the other hand, if someone names several movies, it gives you a better chance of being able to connect at least one of them to your own favorites and move forward with the conversation. Here's another example. Imagine asking someone, what's your ultimate dream vacation? This question would likely put the person in a conundrum as to how they should answer. 
Do they decide based on how appealing the destination is? Do they put more weight on the place's sites or its culture? Do they need to mention time of the year, travel companions, budget considerations? The point is, that single question touches several matters at once and would easily overwhelm the person you're talking with, especially if you're only aiming to achieve an easy, casual conversation. A key point to keep in mind is that if your question branches out to smaller points, it would do better posed in terms of its branches rather than imposed as an entire tree. So, instead of expecting someone to decide on their ultimate dream vacation on the spot, consider moving your conversation along with the following more manageable prompts. What cool vacation places have you looked up recently? Any beach destinations you would recommend for a summer trip? Would you prefer to travel with friends than feel safe? There isn't an opportunity to judge, taste, or opinion. Some of us may never think about this, while others of us are constantly consumed by avoiding judgment. If I were to say, I think Forrest Gump is the greatest movie of all time, I imagine someone would judge me for my taste. It's a fairly black and white statement, so either you agree or disagree. It's a stance, and with each stance, there is an anti-stance. However, if instead you said, I saw Forrest Gump recently, and it was pretty good. You still contribute to the topic of movies with substance, yet it's unlikely anyone will judge you, unless they truly hate Tom Hanks and feel-good movies. Again, this avoidance of judgment may seem unimportant, but it is assuredly not to some people, especially those who suffer from types of social anxiety. A good conversationalist's talent is making sure the other person is comfortable. With comfort comes openness, then comes rapport, then comes an environment ripe for witty banter. We can do this by remembering to ask broader questions that aren't looking for a right or wrong answer. Who knows what the best movie is? This is never the point. The best questions are subjective, and your goal should be to keep conversational flow and create an environment of comfort and familiarity. Avoiding absolute questions means sharpening your question asking skills. It forces you to stand in the other person's shoes and see things from their conversational perspective. You have to take into consideration how the conversation feels from their side and not just throw out a question that happens to be stuck in your head that ends up being extremely difficult to answer. Flow doesn't happen on accident. Now, what if you find yourself on the receiving end of an absolute question? Should that signal the death of the conversation? Not necessarily. You can also learn how to answer absolute questions that you're asked. We know now that absolute questions can be difficult to navigate, so you should be able to answer them more generally in a way that can contribute to flow. Say someone asks you that question about your ultimate dream vacation. Instead of getting stumped, recall that such a question has different facets and you don't need to cover all of them in your response. You may choose to answer just one specific aspect of it. For instance, by responding, I haven't really thought of it, but I've seen a feature on Bora Bora and it looks pretty interesting. Well, for this winter, some of those ski resorts seem inviting. Anywhere with my two best friends would be a blast. Remember, place boundaries on your answers, and this often means answering a slightly different question than was asked. It's all too easy when you understand that people aren't seeking an accurate answer or stance. They just want to move things along. Think before you react. I'd been talking to a coworker for about five minutes at a networking event, and I was growing wearier by the second. She seemed to think our conversation was a high-stakes poker game because her face and voice were as flat as the paisley wallpaper next to her. At times, there wasn't even a blink to indicate she had heard what I said. I tried making a joke about how networking events were a human version of butt-sniffing that dogs engage in and that didn't warrant a smile either. To exit the conversation, I told her that I needed to visit the restroom, and I'm not sure she heard that either. 
Reactions are extremely important in conversation. A conversation without reactions from the other party is like a movie without background music. At first, things seem fine, but you quickly notice that it feels empty. Something's missing. You feel as if you're speaking to a wall you can't read, and one that you're not even sure is listening to what you're saying. You're not sure what to feel and how to proceed, because there are no cues given. Reactions show people that you're more than just physically present. You are emotionally and intellectually present. If you match the energy of the person you're talking to, you'll also make them feel like you understand them better than you actually do. As with many things, reactions have a cumulative effect. If, during a five-minute conversation, the other person does not react to one or two statements you make, you might not notice. But suppose that person doesn't respond ten times in a row to something you've said. Wouldn't you start to feel anxious, as if you said the wrong thing and they're punishing you with their complete lack of reaction? There are a few different levels to reactions that make it clear you are listening and present. It can be something as simple as raising your eyebrow and saying, Oh? Or even just nodding. Small acknowledgments like these should not be underrated. You don't have to be an expert at reacting or make a big show of it. You just need to let the other person know you're engaged. Even so, there are a few ways you can tune your reactions so that people feel a sense of conversational flow with you. The first element is to make sure you react with the appropriate emotion. Imagine that you tell a story about breaking your arm and the other person reacts with anger. Was that the reaction that you wanted or expected to receive? No. You probably shared that story because it was either funny or pitiful, or both. Depending on the tone of your story, you were either looking for a laugh or sympathy or a little of both. Wow, that really sucks. Or, wow, it's hilarious, but it sucks too. Anger as a response to your story just wouldn't make sense. The easiest way to make sure you react appropriately to a story, statement, or question is to take a step back and ask yourself, what is the primary emotion being shared here? And then give that back to them. Keep in mind that the intensity of your emotion matters as well. To use the same example, if you were to say, wow, I can't imagine what I'd do in your position, you might just be overdoing the sympathetic reaction. On the other hand, if you say, that's gotta be inconvenient, you're probably not being sympathetic enough, which can make the other person feel like you're undermining their emotions. As such, once you recognize the emotion they're looking for, take care to also return it in equal measure as they expressed it to you. Here's a tip. The vast majority of emotions people share and want reciprocal, congruent reactions to are joy, annoyance, anger, sadness, humor. Note that three out of the five are negative. For example, did I tell you about how this guy cut me off in traffic earlier today? That's a combination of annoyance and anger. This is something that becomes instinctual and nearly instantaneous after a little bit of practice. Just think, what emotion do they want? What you're really trying to determine is what emotion they feel so you can respond in kind. When your responses accurately fit what the other person is saying and feeling, it tells them you understand them, that you can walk a mile in their shoes. You create a lot of subconscious comfort when you react in a way that accurately corresponds to their feelings. To reinforce such expression of understanding to the person you're talking with, take it up a notch by also mimicking their facial expression and gestures. Psychological research has shown that mirroring, a technique that involves subtly copying the other person's body language during an interaction, facilitates liking. So, in responding to that person's story of being cut off in traffic, make sure you not only verbally express your annoyance, but also show it in the furrowing of your brows or the twisting of your mouth to one side. The second way to make your reactions great is to react 
just a little slower than you think you should. In general, a strong reaction is better than no reaction at all. If you are stone-faced and unreactive, people feel as if they are speaking to a wall, but reacting too quickly can impart a similar frustration. The other person may feel you're just patronizing them and are not truly interested in what they have to say. Imagine a scenario where you are excited to share something about your weekend. The person you're sharing with is nodding vigorously the whole time you're telling your story. In fact, they are almost interrupting you with their excitement. Right after you share something, they exclaim, I know, or yeah, totally, I get it. At some point, it becomes pretty clear that there is no way they could have processed what you said that quickly. They're just acting with fake enthusiasm because that's what they think they should do. Did they even hear what you said amidst all that nodding and exclaiming? Because they reacted too quickly, you assume they only listened for a few trigger words and were answering out of reflex or habit, not in response to your actual words. If you react too quickly, no matter your reasons for doing so, it makes you look dismissive. It makes the person you're speaking with feel as if you're not truly hearing them. You can say, I get it, all you want. But the message is that you don't get it, and you're just trying to get them to stop talking. It's not a great way to build mutual comfort in a conversation. When you react too quickly, it also makes people feel rushed. If you constantly bob your head and say, yes, 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 I get it, they feel tremendous pressure to speak quickly and finish up what they're saying. From their perspective, it's as if you're saying you're bored and already know the conclusion, so hurry it up already. In turn, most polite people don't want to bore you. They also don't want you to feel as if you're waiting too long for your turn to speak, so they'll rush, stumble over words, and likely, though perhaps unconsciously, feel annoyed. Whatever the case, you end up creating a serious disincentive for them to freely express themselves and feel comfortable doing it. Instead, they feel they're caught in a race and have to speak really quickly and be done with it because you're waiting for your turn to contribute. If you have a problem with reacting too quickly or overreacting, try the two-second rule. Wait two seconds after the person is done speaking before you say anything. It makes it look as if you're processing and considering what they've just said. Moreover, people are likely to perceive you as smarter if you take a few moments to respond. You say you don't know what to do or think about during those two seconds? Well, how about what was just said and how it relates to you? And how it relates to the rest of the conversation in general? Throw on a thoughtful face, rest your hand on your chin, and people will never question your engagement again. In summary, you don't want to overreact, nor do you want to react too quickly. Practice free association. There are times when it doesn't really matter how good a speaker you are, or how interesting or engaging you might be as a person, or for that matter, how interesting and engaging the person you are speaking to is. Sometimes, Conversations just get stuck. It's no one's fault. It just happens. We can get stuck in topics we don't care about, or a conversation can turn into what feels like an interview, making it feel shallow and awkward. We might discover that we have very little in common with the other person. When we try to think of different things to talk about, it becomes difficult, like trying to climb out of a hole. When we find ourselves in a conversation where we're tangled up in a tough or impossible topic, we end up feeling frozen and trapped, which creates anxiety and frustration. The more we try to get out of the rut of the conversation, the more stuck we feel. So, let's simplify conversation. Conversation is a series of statements, stories, and questions. After one person contributes one of those elements, the other person responds in kind, either on the exact same topic or a topic that is in some way related to the original one. That's where free association comes in. This is the practice wherein you say things that immediately come to mind when you hear something without trying to filter it in any way. Isn't 
conversation just a series of free association exercises? For example, if someone says something to the effect of, I love cats so much, and you know nothing about cats, you might find it difficult to contribute anything to the conversation. If you absolutely hate cats because a cat blinded your right eye when you were a child, this might just be a conversation killer. Or it might launch you into a bitter rant that will also murder the conversation. You might not have anything to say about cats, but what if you took away the statement and context and focused on the word and concept of cats? With simple free association, you can find a way to quickly and efficiently breathe new life into the conversation, regardless of how deeply stuck it may feel. Just free associate five things about cats. In other words, blurt out five things. Nouns, locations, concepts, statements, feelings, words that flashed into your brain when you heard the word cats. Allow your mind to go blank and zero in on the word cats. Stop thinking of the word cats as a trigger to past experiences and memory. Instead, start looking at it as a fresh concept, unconnected to what you've experienced before. Play a word association game with yourself. What does cats make you think of? We're just talking about purely intellectual connections. It doesn't matter what you feel, what your emotions are. It doesn't matter what your experiences were, whether you were traumatized or not. It has nothing to do with that. This is just a purely intellectual challenge to try to rapidly fill out a list of what cats as a concept can be tied to. For most people, when the word cats is mentioned, they think of kittens, cuddles, sandboxes, cheetahs, lions, fish, sushi, fur, dogs, allergies, the musical, etc. Keep in mind that there is no right or wrong answer here. It's all free association. What's important is that you're rapidly filling out that list of things that you can intellectually connect with the word cats. You'll notice that doing this is much easier than coming up with a responsive statement or question to the declaration, I love cats so much, yet your task and challenge is exactly the same. Where do you go with what the other person said? With that framework and perspective, it's much easier to disassociate from the actual statement and free associate with the subject matter. Doing this will train your brain to think outside the cat box, approach conversation in a non-linear way, and see the many possible directions one simple concept or word can take you. For instance, you may respond to the statement, I love cats so much, with any of the following replies. I've always wondered whether cats enjoy cuddle time as much as dogs seem to do. Have you heard of these hypoallergenic cat breeds? So, would Cats the Musical be something you'd enjoy watching? Now, suppose that someone proclaimed their love for car racing, and suppose that you know nothing about that either. What are the top five or six free associations that come to mind for car racing? For me, it's a mixture of 1. NASCAR 2. Gas 3. Tires 4. The Fast and Furious Movies 5. Japan Don't ask me 6. Mustangs Here's the magic part. Each of these six associations are perfectly normal topics to switch to that are still in the flow of the conversation. I love watching car racing. It's so fun. You mean like NASCAR or illegal street racing? I always wondered what kind of gas mileage those cars get. Do those cars have specialized tires? I don't think my car's tires could take that. So, are the Fast and Furious movies your favorites? I heard they do some kind of drift racing in Japan. Do you mean like that? I always imagine car racing happens with huge, powerful Mustangs. Is that the kind of car races you watch? Try free association with the words coffee and trains, and think about how much easier it is to construct questions and generally converse about something 
once you can form a mental map of the subject and its related topics. You just feel unstuck. Of course, the best way to do this is not to try it the first time when you're in an actual conversation. Free associating is the easy part, but utilizing the things that come to your mind in an ongoing conversation can sometimes be tricky. Practice free association consciously several times throughout the course of a week. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Here's how to practice. On a piece of paper, write five random words. It can be anything, a noun, verb, memory, or even an emotion or feeling. Suppose the first word you write is napkin. As quickly as possible, write three associations for that word. Take the last word you came up with, and then as quickly as possible, write three associations for that new word. Repeat three times, and then move to the next set of words. Napkin, table, spoon, fine dining. Fine dining, France, Michelin star, butler. Butler, Jeeves, white gloves, Michael Jackson, and so on. Practicing free association is an excellent foundation for good conversation because conversation is about relating unrelated ideas, making connections, and going with the flow of topics. Next time you're struggling for something to say, take a step back and tap into your previously practiced free association skills. Just as with anything else that has to do with conversation skills, you can only master it if you tried enough times. The best part of all this is that you can do it instantly. You get caught in a stream of consciousness flow. Always remember, there is no right or wrong answer. If you believe there is, you'll be putting unnecessary pressure on yourself. In case you find yourself in a hole with the free association technique for any reason, one alternative you can fall back on is to simply ask the other person to elaborate about what they said. So. If someone claims to love cats or racing, nudge them to speak more about it. This will give you more material to work and free associate with. For example, common reasons for liking cats include them being cute and independent compared to dogs. If someone cites these reasons, you now have more things to free associate from. Cats, cuteness, and independence. Use this abundance to come up with good responses. Flow achieved, silence averted. Use double explanations. During a typical conversation, certain patterns arise. It really boils down to the first 10 questions you'll probably answer when you meet someone new. By keeping these questions in mind and strategically selecting your answers, your conversations can be more satisfying and you can take advantage of these patterns by making them work for you. At the very least, you'll be able to extend the life of a typical conversation. Know these patterns and come up with distinct ways to draw out more answers, extend the conversation, and otherwise pack more perceived value into the exchange. Regardless of who and where you meet someone, I can tell you the first 10 questions and topics that will likely come up. These first 10 questions can set you on a path toward flow or they can set the tone for stagnancy and boredom. Usually it goes like this. How are you? How was your weekend? Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? Do you have siblings? What do you do? What did you study? It's important to enter any conversation with fully prepared answers for these common questions. If you let these small opportunities pass, you end up with boring and unengaging answers. Think of these questions as invitations to say something interesting. By preparing for them, you can come up with an answer that will engage people while still answering the question. You come off as creative and interesting because you're ready with something unexpected to say. That's where double answers, as the section title implies, come in. The first step is to come up with an interesting answer for the questions you know you'll be asked, but keep your answer short and simple, a layman's explanation. Your goal is to give information in an interesting and unique way. For example, when somebody asks, what do you do? A dry, boring answer is, I'm a lawyer. Instead, your answer should be something short and pithy like, I file paperwork for a living, or I'm paid to argue with people. 
The first path will probably not lead to intrigued questions, while the second path will certainly require closer examination. And that's just what you want. That's flow. You get people curious. You get them to open up about what you have to say. And then you can proceed with the double explanation. To come up with powerful double explanations to common questions, start by constructing layman's explanations for each question you know you will be asked. Again, a layman's explanation is simple, provides context, is unexpected, and draws people in. It prompts people to be interested in what you're saying. It gives you an opening to further explain yourself, and it overall lays a far wider net or funnel to engage people. You state general enough so that you can reach the most people, but specific enough so that you're not boring or without substance. The layman's explanations are the first step to a double explanation. The second step involves the expert explanation. Expert explanations are what you offer once you've drawn people in with your simplified or layman's take on the topic. It's the second layer that you should have prepared for moments when it appears that someone wants to engage you further on the same topic. This explanation draws their attention. Now that you've hooked the other party, it opens the conversation to deeper levels of engagement. This also comes in handy when you run into somebody who actually understands the context of your answer. For example, at a dinner party, the other person might actually be a fellow attorney. When you say, I file paperwork for a living, she might respond with, so do I, that's a big part of my job. And then it turns out that she's also a lawyer. The other party will quickly grasp your layman's explanation and ask you for a deeper explanation, which you will have prepared beforehand. Essentially, the layman's explanation is an introduction, and the expert explanation is a deeper look to reveal more if you're prompted to do so. Following the example above, a good expert explanation would be, well, I'm a corporate lawyer and specialize in business transactions and corporate filing, lots of corporation creation and also some investments and loan documents. Always have these double explanations prepared. Lead with a layman's explanation because these make you look interesting and prevent you from missing a chance to make an impression. They make you appear witty, and they open the conversation to deeper levels of engagement. However, ensure that your responses do not seem rehearsed. It can be fairly easy to spot someone who is mechanically repeating lines they've wrote learned, so pause for a moment or two before replying. Here's another example. A layman's answer to the question of, what did you do last weekend, could be, I went skiing and generally flattened the snow a lot with my butt from falling. This question can go either way. The person can say, well, that's awesome, and then move on to another topic, or they can choose to talk about finer details of skiing. If you notice that this person is asking for more details, is themselves a skier, or is generally drawn in by your opening statement, you can offer the expert explanation. Oh, I went on two black diamonds, one blue diamond, and got fitted for new ski poles because my old ones were bent from going over moguls. These terms will only make sense to somebody who goes skiing a lot. This will let the other person know that you know what you're talking about and that you share the same interests. At the same time, you don't want to appear as if you're throwing around a lot of big words just because you can. It's a surefire way of being perceived as arrogant. If you sense that the other person is interested, but not someone who skis, simplify your expert explanation so that it's easily understandable for them. Once you know the conversation won't remain superficial, you can unleash your expert explanation on people to create engagement and immediately capitalize on a common interest. The bottom line is that by preparing beforehand, you can make conversations take a life of their own. And the good news is, as I've mentioned, conversations often involve questions that aren't all that new. They're very predictable. If you were to boil down all your conversations, they could be summed up in about 10 questions, so it's easy to prepare. By being aware of the most common questions and coming up with maybe three interesting stories or opening lines for each, you go a long way in becoming a better conversationalist. More effective compliments. Compliments can help your conversations last longer and make you the object of someone's attention and affection. The trick is, 
You need to know how to use them properly. I recall once, when I was a child, I was complimented on my hair and eyes by a substitute teacher looking to make conversation. The only reason I remember it is because it was clear that the substitute was trying to make a good impression on me, so she kept complimenting me on the same things every time she saw me. Every time I came into the room from recess, every time I walked into class in the morning, every time I came back from the bathroom, even as a child, I knew something was weird. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that compliments are like candy. They believe the more candy they give out, the more other people will like them. That is, until the inevitable sugar rush crash or cavity, more is not always better. On paper, compliments are great things, but if you use them improperly or in the wrong context, whatever good they can produce is flushed down the toilet. The substitute teacher from my youth took all of the goodwill she had with me and promptly flushed it down the toilet because it felt so unnatural and forced to be complimented so much. Compliments are usually thought of as good things, but sometimes they can make you look untrustworthy or like a flatterer. Compliments from someone who gives them out easily and frequently have little value. However, if you're perceived as the kind of person who compliments or appreciates things only when he genuinely sees value in them, your words will carry much more meaning. As I've said often in this book, your main objective is to ensure that both of you develop a mutual comfort and confidence. A ham-fisted compliment doesn't help create that effect. When was the last time somebody complimented you? What did you feel when you heard the compliment? It feels good to be told that you're doing something right or you have some redeeming value. People like to feel validated and appreciated. Paying compliments can go a long way in producing these feelings. In conversations, compliments create an air of positivity, which can boost the overall level of comfort people have with you. A properly paid compliment can go a long way in making you look good in other people's eyes. This is not only in your mind. You start breathing a certain way. Your blood starts pumping a certain way. There's a correlation between your emotional state and physical response. The reverse is also true. When somebody says something positive to you, your brain produces neurotransmitters that are associated with a sense of well-being and happiness. If, for example, one of your friends constantly compliments you and never fails to make you feel better about yourself, you probably start looking forward to seeing that person. You might not be able to put your finger on it, but you just want to be around him or her. What has actually happened is that your brain has paired this friend with the positive feeling of being complimented, thus creating an automatic reaction of feeling good every time you're with that person. Eventually, this positive conditioning becomes somewhat addictive. When you're around people who constantly make you feel good, you want to be around them more often. The flip side is also true. If you come across people that are predictably negative and put you in a bad place mentally and emotionally, your tendency is to run away from them. See, conditioning also works in such a way that your brain comes to pair certain people with negative emotions, making you instantly feel ill at ease when they're around. One of the fundamental rules of likability and charisma is the concept of reciprocity. Put simply, we are kind to people who are kind to us first. Rarely do you see somebody who reacts very negatively when somebody gives them a gift or dresses their wounds or otherwise helps them. It's a nearly universal trait. Reciprocity is in play. When you compliment somebody, they feel good and they feel benefited by your act. They will then look for an opportunity to repay you for your positive act by complimenting you back. This reciprocity creates a pleasant interaction and increases the level of comfort you have with each other. However, it's easy to get caught up in the benefits of complimenting and assume that just because you compliment people, they will automatically get what you mean. You end up feeling entitled to a certain return for the compliments you dish out. It doesn't work that way, as my substitute teacher learned. You have to compliment the right way, or your compliments will at best fall flat and at worst seem disingenuous. Instead of getting people to drop their guard, people become suspicious or skeptical of your motives. You end up producing the exact opposite effect that you intended. 
the first thing you need to focus on is what to compliment other people on. You have to choose things to praise others for that will have the greatest impact. In other words, it has to be something that they actually care about. Otherwise, your compliment will come off as less than genuine and you'll give the impression that you're fake or manipulative. That's the first rule of thumb. You want your compliments to have maximum effect. You want them to affect people the right way. Here are the two key areas that are important as far as the focus of your compliments goes. Things people have control over and things people have made conscious and specific choices about. You should compliment people on the things they can control, like their clothing, fashion style, hairstyle, and living space. While these seem like just superficial material elements, they are also personal and impactful. Why? Because these things reflect who a person is and what they've done, whereas complimenting them on something they don't have control over, such as their eye color, doesn't. The person has actual control over the things I listed, and they've made a choice. They've chosen their personal fashion style, their haircut, and the way they've decorated their house or flat. These things reflect a person's tastes and values. Take wardrobe, for example. People dress a certain way because they have definite values. How they dress also reflects their habits and how they'd like to be seen in the world. Choose things that they've obviously put some thought into. This might include a bright shirt, a distinctive handbag, an unusual piece of art, or a vintage car. These are characteristics that are out of the ordinary, uncommon, and that reflect a deliberate deviation from the norm. However, if you have to choose from many things to compliment someone about, pick the one that is the least obvious. Say your girlfriend dresses up for you on an occasion. She wears a fancy dress, styles her hair, and puts on nice shoes. Which one do you compliment? Go with the least obvious one, say her earrings. It can sometimes be easy to compliment the obvious, but appreciating the things that go unnoticed makes people feel extra special because it tells them that you took the time and effort to pay close attention to them. What makes these compliments effective is that these kinds of personal statements are what make the person feel unique. For example, imagine I prefer Hawaiian shirts. I always show up wearing one. I obviously think highly of Hawaiian shirts, and I somehow, some way, believe they make me look different from the crowd. If I'm complimented on my Hawaiian shirts, it's just confirmation that others see my train of thought and also see me as unique and interesting. In other words, a lot of my persona and personhood are ingrained in the fact that I choose to wear these types of shirts. By complimenting someone on something they've clearly chosen with purpose, you acknowledge and validate the statement they have chosen to make about themselves. You go out of your way to let them feel special. How do you tell what has special meaning to a person? Focus on how much time and effort are normally involved in these decisions. Somebody's political position is not something they take lightly. It's something that probably took a lot of time and consideration to develop. Often, their political position is a product of their experience. Though it might be awkward to directly compliment a political viewpoint, you can try and find areas of agreement between their perspective and your own to validate them. This will show them that you're open-minded and accepting of contrasting viewpoints. When you compliment things that reflect individual choices, your compliments can have quite an impact. Other characteristics you can compliment people about are their manners, the way they phrase certain ideas, their opinions, their worldview, and their perspective. You're saying, I agree with the choices that you've made, and I understand your train of thought. The converse would be complimenting someone on something they have zero control over, such as their height. It's nice to hear, but it ultimately amounts to, hey, good job getting lucky in the jeans department, which doesn't create much of an impact. Remember, it's not something they worked for or made a choice about. Unless you're complimenting their eyelash extensions or the shape of their eyebrows, which of course take effort to achieve, the compliment doesn't really go that far. Since it's highly likely that a person has heard somebody else get complimented about their eyes, they won't feel particularly special 
if they receive a compliment about their own eyes. And if their eyes really are notable, they've probably heard it a thousand times themselves, so you haven't offered anything different. Your compliments have to zero in on something that provides a measure of validation. For instance, an unusual hairstyle that makes them feel special and unique. By directing your compliment there, you highlight their own self-perceived sense of how special they truly are. When you compliment somebody's eyes, or any feature they can't control, like their height, it seems generic, because there are lots of people on this planet who have bright, attractive eyes. It's not special, they've heard it before, and you could conceivably give that same compliment to 50 people that very day. There's no ownership over it. Likewise, there are lots of people who are tall. What does saying, you're so tall, it's great, really mean to someone? If somebody has two arms and two legs, that's not much of a compliment. In contrast, if somebody obviously works out and is suddenly wearing tighter t-shirts, that can be a tremendous source of pride for them. Why? They put in a lot of work. They changed their normal physique from beer belly to cut and well-defined. They've made a proactive, deliberate attempt to achieve that physique. They care. If you truly want to maximize the effect and impact of your compliment, it all starts with being observant about other people. Pay attention to how you think they want to be perceived, because that will give you some insight into their insecurities, and you can use your compliments to build their confidence in those areas. If someone constantly goes to the gym and makes fitness a large part of their lifestyle, it's pretty certain that they want to be perceived as fit, active, and invested in health. Call that out with a compliment. Compliments that target things the person has put great effort into will pay huge dividends. This formula pays off like clockwork. Takeaways. You know those people who always have something clever or witty to say? Ever wonder how they cultivated this seemingly magical quality? If you have, Know that being witty is much easier than you might think, and you don't have to be born with the gift of gab. By following certain tricks and techniques, you can develop the same persona yourself. The first element to tackle is conversational flow and keeping a back and forth going. The first trick in the book is to never speak in absolutes. Eliminate questions and statements involving words like favorite, absolute, only, worst, etc. from your vocabulary. If you ask someone, what's your absolute favorite movie? You're actually asking a pressurized question that introduces pause and destroys flow. Instead, always generalize your questions by putting boundaries and constraints on them. This doesn't require as much thought from your conversational partner, allowing them to simply answer a question with a range of responses, instead of being caught looking for the one right answer. Reactions are important. People say and do things for a reason, and it's usually to get a reaction. This step is deceptively simple, yet difficult. Pay attention to other people and ask yourself what emotion they want to evoke. Then, give it to them. Don't take too long to reply, but being too quick isn't advisable either. This is all to make others feel that you are present and engaged. If your mind goes blank, use a technique called free association to generate a response. These are words that immediately come to mind upon hearing something. For example, if someone talks about cats, practice free association with the provided exercises, and you'll be able to come up with answers more quickly and easily. Conversation as a whole is just a series of interrelated responses and stories, so free association is practicing conversation flow. Regardless of who you're talking to, you're likely to be asked the same set of generic questions. These include, what do you do, how was your day, and others like these. You'll want to have two separate answers prepared for such questions, one of which is interesting and unique, the layman explanation, while the other is more informative, the expert explanation. Being too esoteric upon first meeting someone isn't always helpful and can confuse and render others speechless. Finally, learn to give good compliments. This is also deceptively easy. Compliment things that people have control over or made a choice about. 
don't choose generic qualities like height or eye color. Instead, choose things that people actively put effort into. People feel comfortable and flattered and then start to open up.